Scott. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this very exciting event that uh, Ivan and I are hosting as part of the Applied Young Economics webinar series. Um, if you are familiar with our webinar series, you know that uh, we developed this webinar as a, as, a, as a platform to provide an opportunity for PhD students to present their work and to get feedback. Um, and this actually started during the pandemic when we couldn't uh, actually move uh, to other places. So uh, today's uh, event is uh, also a part of our vision to assist uh, PhD students to prepare themselves to the, for the job market. And uh, with the job market season coming up, we thought uh, that this will be very helpful to provide this information to those on the job market. And we are very thankful to the three panelists who are joining us today. We have uh, Professor Sasha Becker uh, from uh, Monash uh, and Warwick, and then we have Dr. Ludovica Gasse from Warwick, and we have Dr. Vajia Lee from Monash joining us as panelists. Um, so uh, the, the idea here is that we have uh, panelists representing both sides of the hiring process. Uh, so basically Ludovica and Vajia who just um, who very recently underwent the job market process themselves can give us some insights from the applicant's perspective, while Sasha, who's been on hiring committees uh, over the years, uh, can give us uh, some insights on what the universities expect from, uh, expect from uh, candidates. So I'll just give a brief introduction to our panelists. Uh, so Professor Sasha Becker, he uh, did his PhD at the European University Institute, and then he joined uh, the University of Stirling, um, after which, uh, sorry, he joined LMU Munich and then University of Stirling, and after uh, spending quite a bit of time at the University of Warwick, he recently joined Monash, and he's also a part-time professor at the University of Warwick. Uh, Dr. Ludovica Gasse did her PhD at MIT, and then uh, did a postdoc at the University of Chicago, and is now an assistant professor at the University of Warwick. Um, and Dr. Vajia Lee did his PhD at Berkeley and joined Monash as an assistant professor in 2018. So uh, these three panelists will, uh, as I mentioned, share their insights um, today. Uh, in terms of the structure of today's event, the first 30 minutes will be uh, allocated to the three panelists. So each of them will have 10 minutes to give us their insights. And then uh, during the second half an hour, I will hand over to Ivan, uh, who will then moderate the Q&A session. So you could uh, direct your questions to the panelists and we hope to have an engaging and uh, interacting uh, conversation around your question. And in terms of uh, the house rules, uh, I, uh, I ask that uh, it would be great if you can keep your microphones on mute unless you are asking a question. Um, and if you can rename your display name to reflect your full name and affiliation, that would be very welcome. So we know where you're from and who you are. Um, and also if your, your connection uh, uh, and if your situation allows it, we, we would really like to have the, uh, we would welcome it if you can keep your camera on. Uh, so we develop this, uh, this nice uh, participating and engaging audience. So uh, with that, uh, I think we can start with our panelists today. Uh, the first person uh, that we invite is Dr. Ludovica Gasse from Boric. Um, it'll be great if you can share some insights with us, Ludovica. Thank you. Perfect. And um, thank you very much for having me. You should be able to see my screen now. Uh, let me go to, um, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, perfect. So um, just a kind of disclaimer, you know, these are my personal thoughts on the job market, um, given how I experienced it. Um, so absolutely don't take it with a grain of salt. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll hear from three of us today, you can always ask uh, for, you know, for more experiences and, uh, you know, and, and do and ultimately do what, what's good for you. Um, so a bit about my story. I graduated from MIT in 2016. I uh, utterly failed the market the first time around. Uh, I had about 15 interviews, mostly in the US, uh, even though I'm from Italy originally and I did apply to Europe. Uh, at that time, I didn't apply to the private sector because um, I was dead set that I wanted to be an academic. 
Um, I ended up having two flyouts, one of which was a postdoc, um, and one of not actually my like my the, the postdoc I ended up doing a different one, and one flyout uh, was at the Fed board. It was scheduled uh, pretty late uh, in the game to sort of uh, to do what what I experienced as a kind of like save you know rescue mission, uh, given that my um, my market wasn't going as well. Uh, noted that the position was in the global finance unit, uh, and I was on the market as an applied microeconomist urban environment. So uh, I don't know that it would have been a good fit uh, ultimately. Um, then what happened was uh, Professor Michael Greenston, who was a former MIT faculty, so we knew each other. He heard I wasn't doing as well, and kind of created a position for him for me to help him run um, his new uh, energy and environment lab at the University of Chicago. Um, as uh, in the position of a postdoc. Um, and something I want to mention is that kind of I perceive this position as a favor to me. Uh, you know, four years in, uh, I can tell you it wasn't. Uh, it was definitely a two way match. Uh, I think I benefited a ton from, from that position, uh, but I also gave uh, quite a bit to the lab in terms of help, it, help its growth. And so that's kind of just a, a little aside in terms of, you know, ultimately what you're going to get is. Uh, you know, nobody is doing you a favor. Like they're hiring you uh, in whatever position because of uh, your skills, because of your potential. And so never think that, you know, somebody is doing you a favor. They're not, uh, they're getting a good deal out of it. Um, so uh, after, during my fourth year in the postdoc, I went to the market again last year. Uh, good news is I got a job. Uh, and uh, also I, I had way more fun this time around, uh, got more interviews, got more flyouts, um, and sort of, it felt like I was much more engaging much more um, with the profession. So what are, uh, you know, what can I say about what changed in the past four years? Uh, I honestly don't know, and I don't know that anyone else knows. Um, I think if there's something that I uh, struggled to uh, deal with at the beginning, but uh, kind of now believe uh, firmly is that market outcomes are idiosyncratic. Uh, and so you can't read too much in what happens, uh, especially, I mean, I, you know, in a year like, like this one, right? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, I think that uh, there's definitely something that, that matters, which is, of course, people want to hire somebody that they can give tenure to. Uh, and, and so they want somebody who is going to be productive and happy uh, at, their, at their place. And so, um, of course, you know, the four years in the postdoc uh, gave me more experience. Uh, I had a bigger portfolio of projects. And so that, that helped. Uh, and, uh, you know, luckily for me, maybe unluckily for, for some of the more junior candidates, you know, there's no discounting of postdoc. I went to the market as a junior um, and, uh, um, and that, there was absolutely no discounting for my age or seniority. Uh, what I did this time around is I actively reached out uh, and signaled my interest in places, exploiting the network that I already had. Uh, so uh, whenever I knew somebody at a place, I, I would just email them. Uh, sometimes I, it was a kind of a request of, you know, you have a posting that is a cross uh, posting between, you know, the biology department and the econ department, do you think it would be a good fit for me, right? Uh, sometimes it was a, just a, a true signal. I, I applied, uh, you know, I would love to come, uh, to come to work there. Sometimes it was kind of more of a, you know, inquiry into the process, the, the, you know, the timeline, have you already made decision? These are, of course, I, I would do it if I was more comfortable with the person. Um, and, and so for me, it was really key to have sort of a two-way inflow, information flow. Um, of course, as a PhD candidate, you might not have a, a very extended network. And so he really sort of being able to, to work with your advisors on, on getting that information, I think is key. And I'll, I'll get a bit, um, I'll get back to this later, uh, actually in the next slide. Um, so Manage, I think what's really important for me was to manage my advisors both time. So talk to them uh, about pretty much anything. Of course, you know, there is seniority, there is uh, hierarchy issues, but talk to them about uh, your expected outcomes, right? Like, are your expectations in line with theirs? <laughs> uh, you know, it, with respect to what, you, what they think you're going to get and what you think you're going to get. 
uh, about, and I, I can't stress it enough, about your personal priorities. It's your life. Do you want to go work in a given continent? Yes or no? It seems like a pretty big uh, decision. So you, you're you allowed to express opinions and preferences, uh, but it's good to know them early on so that the, uh, the advisors can work within those constraints. Um, also talk to them about updates so that you can kind of strategize as, strategize as you go, right? So I think for me, it was helpful to establish communication rules. Like I would send them weekly updates. And then, you know, when I had a 14 hour exploding offers, I emailed and put urgent in cap, you know, in capital letters. And they called me across continents to, to figure out what to do in that case. It wasn't Warwick, by the way. Warwick was, was much nicer with their deadline. Um, so I don't know about the Warwick uh, or Monash system, um, but uh, you know, at MIT, everything was very centralized. So we had CV templates and we worked to use just the official MIT CV template. Um, I think that was helpful. It eliminated a lot of uh, uncertainty about what we had to do. Um, so I, I would say when in doubt, ask your advisors to review some of your materials. Like I think the CV is really important. I think Sasha has some insights on where to put things on the, on the CV, you know, you want things to be visible. Uh, of course, within reason, you don't want to bombard them with, uh, with checking too many drafts or, you know, other things like cover letters, statement, personal statements. I think you can ask uh, what we, we had is we, we had materials from the previous cohorts and we would just kind of go off of those. Uh, I think uh, for me, it was important to, to think about my peers and my support networks uh, sort of more generally. Uh, the market is very stressful. It is not zero sum uh, for a given cohort, uh, but it kind of might feel like it, especially if you have your best friend who is also a health economist and also trying to get a job uh, in what feels like, oh, you know, there's not that many positions for that. Uh, and so my first market, I kind of had communication roles with my closest friends in the program as well. So what we would share and what we wouldn't and at what point. Uh, and, and I think that that worked really well. In my second market, I didn't have a reference cohort. I had a few friends who were also doing postdocs. Um, again, for me, that kind of worked better so that I didn't have somebody to, to constantly kind of compare myself to. Uh, but what I really uh, sort of uh, think it's important, it's also, you know, talk to your friends, if you have a partner, your family, you know, this is all stressful and just having pretty much being upfront about what they can ask and when, I think that just was very much a relief for me. Um, I am happy to talk more offline about postdocs. They are a very strange, strange beast. You know, traditionally in the profession, we have like one year po uh, postdocs uh, while you're deferring your assistant professor job. Increasingly, and that was my case, you have a two or three year postdoc with nothing lined up at the end. Uh, this was not the outcome I wanted. Uh, I felt really like I wanted to hide under a rock for the beginning of that, uh, you know, like I didn't belong at UChicago. Uh, but, you know, I, after I processed that grief, you know, I, I thought I understood that it was important to make the most out of the opportunity. It's a way to increase your network, uh, to get your face out, to talk to people and start new projects. And so I started to, you know, get myself on the list for talking to speakers and going to seminars, ask questions uh, and sort of get more involved with the place. Um, when if you're thinking about postdocs, if you're negotiating, a longer postdoc is better professionally. If you have a two-year postdoc, that means that you're going to spend your first year trying to write a new job market paper, and then you're going to spend your second year doing what you're just doing right now. Um, so three years, I, I, I would strongly uh, advise for. But of course, uh, you know it's your life, and so you're get you're going to be three years older when you start your assistant professor job, right? Uh, it's a bit of a weird market. Some of these positions might be created for you. So that's why kind of talking to advisors to the network is really important because some of these things just pop up uh, at a later stage. Um, a, a couple of thoughts on virtual interviews and seminars. I had a couple of virtual interviews. Um, there was one in which the committee was not in the same room, which I would imagine this year will be the case. Um, I like to put everyone in grid view so I can see everyone. For virtual talks, establish rules for interruptions. Uh, even if they tell you that you know they're going to do questions and at the end, you can say that you welcome questions during the talk. Ask if someone is moderating and can check if there are questions. 
uh, close-ups that give notifications, pop-up sounds, of course. Uh, I used to put my, uh, my laptop in, in a flight mode uh, and now you can't anymore. Um, so things will pop up and distract you. Um, I think one thing I've noticed is that, you know, sometimes you want to take time to think about answers, but then on Zoom, it looks like you're frozen. So just kind of, you know, make sure that, that you have that, uh, you're, you're still interacting with people. I think appendix slides are going to be even more important to manage time, just because I think sometimes the, the, the number of questions is, is, is more difficult to manage uh, with, uh, with virtual seminars. Uh, a note on private sector. Um, Schedule informational interviews prior to applying. This is really something that I didn't know. I didn't do the first time around. I didn't apply as much, but this time I, uh, I consider it much more strongly. So if you know somebody who went to work in one of those firms, talk to them and then drop their name in the cover letter. That will show that you're truly interested and that you understand what the job is about. Uh, note that they care about something that might be slightly different from what you A, have learned in the PhD and B, what's, uh, what's part of a, an assistant professor job. They care that you can manage projects uh, and, they care, and a team and they care that you can write. So anything that can signal that in your past experience, you know, you have experience writing grants and stuff like that. That's all, uh, that, that, that's all gonna be good. We were asked to, to say some do's and don'ts. I think in terms of do's, uh, you know, my, my, my first top three are research the place that you're talking to, share why you're excited. The flip side of this is don't lie. If you're not excited about a place, if you're not, you know, if a place is not your first priority, don't tell them they're your first priority. Tell them that they are, you know, in your top 10, right? There's ways of, of, of phrasing things. Use your advisors and your network smartly. Uh, and you know, allow yourself to feel feelings. This is really hard. I don't have a ton of other don'ts. Uh, so these are more kind of life, <laughs> life things. You know, don't suppress your priorities. Think about whether you really like a job or not. It's okay to to say no. Uh, but again, it's it's better to know your priorities ex ante. Uh, also, don't infer anything from first impressions. I have plenty. I've had plenty of interviews where I left the room and I was like, ah, they're gonna invite me. They're gonna hire me. And then actually there was politics behind and they didn't invite me for a fly out. And then I had a couple where I, I left the room and I was like, I clearly blew this one and I got a fly out interview that night. So it's really, uh, it's really tough. Um, and yes, you have my email. Uh, I think I went way over, but you have my email. Uh, I'm on social media. Uh, please we do reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you, Ludovica. Um, I'm sure we'll have many questions for you at the end. Um, so, Regia, it's your turn now. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, so, um, I will mostly try to complement uh, Ludvika and Sasha's talk. So, um, I will basically talk more, more about some more idiosyncratic points, but hopefully they're useful to you too. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I was on market in 2018 and my main fields are political economics and economic history. Uh, I have about 30 interviews. That's quite normal for um, like candidates uh, who are interested in the China market because we have a, a, a very large number of Chinese universities on the market too. Um, I have uh, six flyouts eventually I go and uh, five offers and four direct offers without flyouts. These are from Chinese universities. So I will also talk a little bit more about the China market uh, because uh, it's something that uh, some of you guys may be quite interested in and uh, hopefully my experience will also be more useful. So before I begin to talk about my suggestions, I think the first thing you, of course, you really need to do is to carefully read uh, the official job market guide from the American Economic Association. Uh, even if you're just thinking about going to the market for the year, uh, if you want to go to the market this year, you should definitely do it, read it before the uh, job market process begins. Um, so if you look at the table of the content, it really includes everything. Like uh, the decision whether you want to go to the market, how to apply, the signal, the interview, the campus visit, et cetera. So I will, again, I try to add a few points that are not in the AEA guide, but 
you should familiar yourself with this guide uh, very well. So first thing about the job market paper. So we're told that uh, this, this uh, mini presentation is also for uh, uh, candidates who are probably, who are not going this year. So I will also talk a bit more, more about the, the, the job market paper. So the first thing is about uh, uh, the niche field problem. So some of us who work in niche field like political economy feel that we may have a special problem that is, um, of um, people in the general audience might not be super um, familiar with the field and uh, may not be able to appreciate what we are doing. Uh, so when we want to write a job market paper that one thinks appears to a broader audience. Um, so um, such pandering, however, can be risky because you, have, you, you really need to work on something that you find exciting. Um, but whether this is the optimal strategy, I actually don't know. Uh, but I just want to bring this up and you should definitely discuss this with, with your advisor, whether you want to write, uh, for example, in the political economy field, a, a, a job market paper with a substantial section about public finance or labor, or you want to pursue something more purely political economy. Um, a bit more on applied theory, job market candidates, because uh, many, most of my works are uh, applied theory. So I think uh, especially challenging skill to learn for us is to communicate to the, the gist of your model. Uh, it, like the audience can get lost really quickly if you're not careful. So you really need to know how to uh, streamline your notations, uh, minimize your algebra on the slides. And uh, uh, I think most importantly, trying to convey everything through figures. So um, for, uh, for a guide on how to do this, I really recommend this book by William Thompson. Um, he offers uh, many easy to apply suggestions, um, writing and presenting applied theory papers. So before the job market season, a few things you may want to pay uh, attention to. First, if you can, I think it might be a good idea to attend an AA or EA before your job market year. So you, you will not be able to get into the interview room for sure. Uh, but I think the gen to get a sense of the general vibe might be useful. So if uh, you have some um, 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 job market candidates from your own department who are on the job market, you will definitely run into some of them. So gra even gra just grabbing a coffee with them or having a dinner at the end of the conference, hearing them talking about the <clears throat> their fresh thoughts about the job market might be super useful. Uh, a thing about uh, political economy candidates. Um, so there's a thing about uh, the political science market. Um, uh, if you're interested in it at all, it, it might be a really good fit for some of us. Uh, notice that it starts about three months earlier than economics. Uh, the application deadline, for example, if my memory is not wrong, is usually early September. They don't have interviews, so they uh, send out, fly out invitation directly. And there are also a lot of other idiosyncratic differences uh, compared with uh, the economics job market. So I, uh, I, I didn't go because I think I try to prepare for the market too light. But if, if you're interested in this, you need to prepare this uh, quite early. And uh, I think the best guide for this is um, there's a short piece by Chris Blattman. Uh, from University of Chicago and how, econo uh, how, e how economists uh, should think about the political science market. And this uh, small piece of suggestion is for some international candidates from, for example, China and India. So we have a uh, passport that is very, uh, that basically means that we have um, to apply visa to visit a lot of um, uh, countries. So for us, it's really a good idea to apply uh, American, Schengen, or other visas really early before the job market season began. Uh, of course, if you want to attend AEA or EA meeting, you have to do it. Uh, but if you are American, if you're a candidate based in America and you don't necessarily want to go to EA, but you are still interested in the, in the European market, you still want to apply it because then you don't need to do it during the flyout uh, month. Uh, it, it is super stressful to do it uh, when you are 
also doing flyout, which was what I was doing. So if it's at all possible to do this before the season begins, it's I think it's a really good idea. And if you have not done this before, you should definitely obtain another government ID so you can still travel within the country while your passport is in embassy for a visa. I know this is a lot of hassle for um, Chinese and Indian candidates, but this is something we cannot change. And the best we can do is to plan this ahead. Uh, about the interview, uh, I really want to say that if, if the faculty members in your department organize mock interviews, you should definitely attend. Uh, these are super useful. And another group of um, mock interviews I found super useful, uh, your friends who are rookie APs. Um, so people like us. Uh, so these are also people, uh, I think uh, we offer really useful suggestions for other kind of job market problems you have. So um, you may feel like you don't want to bother them too much, but I think the vast majority of us are very, actually very happy to offer to help uh, for any kind of questions. So another thing is uh, very specific, but uh, um, kind of a trilemma. So starting from last year, there's uh, now three separate markets, the China Job Market Conference, which happens around uh, to December 12th to 15th, EA immediately after that, and then AEA. So for if you're interested in the China market, this is almost impossible to organize logistically because the China Job Market Conference ends on the day when the EA begins. So the best you can do is to play the time difference and left the Beijing the day when the EA began. But then there's a big problem that uh, a lot of the flyouts from the China job market actually happened around Christmas holiday. Um, so that's right before the AEA and it might be super stressful to do it. So uh, if you're interested at all on the, on the China market, you need to think very carefully how you're going to handle this and uh, whether it's the optimal strategy to, apply, uh, to attend all of them or just attend two of them. And uh, the last thing is about, uh, yeah, this is not for this year, but uh, for a non-COVID year. So the quality guide said you should arrive at least one day before the first interview. I think you should arrive at least three days to test your jet lag and uh, watch out for the blizzard. Yeah. And uh, uh, for the Zoom seminars, I think the most important thing for me is to do a few Zoom mock seminars with your advisors and friends. Uh, you will notice many differences with in-person seminars. Um, so you need, really need to adjust to the differences. And uh, for a lot of international candidates like us, uh, in a non-COVID year, going to all your flyouts can be logistically quite difficult. So I went, my flyouts basically scattered all around the world in Asia, Australia, Americas, and Russia. So that's why early planning of the logistics is really important. You should try to apply those visas uh, before the job market season begins. I mean, for those uh, big markets, the Schengen visa and the American visa, I think you should definitely get them before the job market season begins. But still, although it's logistically very doubting to do it, I, I think we should go to as many flyouts as possible. Of course, the first thing is that it will maximize the chance of getting a job. This is also one of the few times when you receive such focused attention from fellow economists. And this is a great opportunity to broadcast your research and uh, Looking back, I think the exhaustion and the temporary, really temporary financial strain are totally worth it. Okay, so so that's that's my mini presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Regia. Uh, now we are over to Sasha from the other side of the table. Hello, Is Sasha here? Sasha just... Looks like it dropped. Yeah, he dropped. Maybe he'll come back in. He just... Yeah, Sasha seemed to just suddenly dropped. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give him a minute or two. I'm back. That was the leave button instead of the share button. <laughs> Can you make me co host again? <laughs> yes, sure, one minute. Okay, done.
Okay. So I talk a bit about um, the hiring side of things. And I also put the video. Okay. So I should uh, give a disclaimer again, these are my private thoughts. Uh, I'm not speaking in any official function. No one even knows in uh, my heads of department in Monash and Warwick don't even know about this. So I'm not speaking in an official function. And I'm also not a human resources person. Yeah? So I'm really just talking out of my head as someone who has done uh, hiring communities for a few years. I want to give you general life advice right away about what Ever person you listen to, never only listen to one person, always ask many people. And lots of people will say nonsense that you discard and whatever is left, you wait by whatever importance you give to different individuals and take the weighted average. Um, that includes advisors, by the way. My background, um, Ashani already gave you my CV. And the point I just want to make is, Life careers are often non-linear and non-monotonic. And Ludovica gave you some ideas about that. But also in my life, I'm maybe one of the few people in, on earth who has done the elevator. I was full professor, went back to associate, went back to full. And there are good reasons for that. Um, but um, life can be non-linear. So um, never give up. Um, OK, so I've been on hiring committees for a few years in uh, Boric, but also now at Monash. And at, Mo at Boric, I also have done negotiations with candidates for some years. So not just sitting on the committee interviewing people, but really setting salaries and stuff. Yeah? So I, I think I have some insights also on how that part of the process works. I talk about application packages, then interviews, flyouts, and then offers. So the first thing I want to get across, because it's hard to understand unless you do the math, uh, is application packages that universities receive is just an amazing amount of paper or PDF or gigabytes of stuff. Um, at places like Monash and Warwick, we get more than 700 applications. And a typical package these days has cover letter, job market paper, reference letters, diversity statements, research statements, and so on and so on. And you know it, many of you have already submitted packages, but the ones who are more in earlier years of the PhD will do that later. So a package easily arrives to 100 to 150 pages times 700 something makes for 100,000 pages of stuff that a committee receives. 100,000 pages, yeah? If you hide the good stuff on page three, of your CV, or it doesn't appear in your cover letter, you minimize the chance that the good stuff will be seen. Yeah? So put, if you have publications, if you have revised and resubmits, they have to be on page one of the CV. They have to be in bold in the cover letter because which human being can read 100,000 pages? Yeah? So the stuff that is important needs to be bold and visible. You should clearly label your job market paper. Often you find applications that don't follow that logic, that just talk about whatever, research and progress and thesis papers. The job market works by declaring what is the main most important piece of work you've been working on for years. What also should go in the cover letter, if you have a strong location preference, such as you are US based, but you die to uh, work in Melbourne, it needs to be written somewhere. No one can guess. Yeah? Publications, the hard reality. This table is from um, a Journal of Economic Perspective paper from a few uh, years ago. And the point it tries to make, the table is huge, but it looks at the top US departments and at publications of PhD, uh, PhDs from these top departments. And if you just stare at the column of the median candidate from a top US department, after six years has essentially zero top fives, yeah? Zero AER equivalent publications. That is just to say that even in the best departments on the planet, according to perception, um, it's not by no means given that people will just publish like crazy, okay? That being said, what is often written in reference letters 
candidates are often oversold by their advisors as the next superstar and like the, the letter next year for the next candidate has to be even more exuberant to make a point that this candidate is even better than the one you saw last year. People know that and that's why they discount letters by certain writers after they've seen letters for a few years in a row because we all know the reality is there is only a limited number of pages in top journals and not everyone can get in. This being said, if you are lucky to have a revise and resubmit or even a publication in a top journal, it has to be written explicitly everywhere. And also your advisors need to write it super clearly on page one of the letter. Otherwise, uh, it might get lost. One of my colleagues told me he wasn't initially invited to manage because somehow it got lost in the process that he had a journal of public economics already as a PhD. Yeah? How to make your application stand out? Good reference letters are important. And that means by backward induction, if you're earlier in the PhD, the job market starts essentially in year one. You need to make friends. You need to find people in the department who believe in you, who follow your work. I've seen far too often a candidate suddenly in October before the job market opens, running up and down the corridor, knocking on doors and essentially saying, oh, I, I need someone to write a letter for me. That's too late. Yeah, it needs to start in here T minus two, T minus three, because only informative letters are good letters. And for that, people need to know you yeah, and also need to say something about the qualities and what is in your DNA. Um, institution specific information needs to be in the cover letter. We said that location preferences, etc. A great job market paper helps. And as we said various times, RNRs and publications also help. The interviews. If you get one, congratulations, you made it, celebrate it. Don't take anything for granted. The numbers given by Veja, 30 interviews, that is the dream thing for US students. That's not the reality of most European or Australian students that they have 30 interviews. Yeah? So celebrate everything you have. Um, and what are interviews about? What am I looking for if I sit in a hotel room in San Diego or Chicago? I'm trying to find a future colleague. Yeah? A department doesn't try to hire a CV, but tries to hire a colleague. But the interview also serves to spot problems in the job market paper or in the CV. Given that reference letters often oversell people because no advisor wants to harm you, the interview also serves to see are those results in the paper really so robust? Are they so exciting? Are they filling a huge gap? Um, and we want to find out, are you a narrow or a deep thinker? Like, are you amazing at cracking one specific type of problem? But as soon as someone talks with you about um, a topic that's in a slightly different subfield, you get lost and you can't say anything sensible. Um, but then also importantly about your job market paper, no one on the planet should know more about your job market paper than you. So that should on the one hand give you confidence, but also, it, it is a demand on you. Yeah? You should be able to answer whatever question people ask you, ideally. You should be honest in an interview. Uh, Ludovica made that point. You can't tell 50 departments that this is the place you want to work for sure, that that's the one and only the top on your list. No one is going to believe you because it's a small world. Interviewers talk. When I go to the meetings, we interview. Of course, I have a beer with people from neighboring departments and from friends around the world. So information flows and suddenly, ah, oh, you also interviewed Ludovica, you also interviewed Veja, and what did he say and what did he tell you? And if um, they also tell me, oh, he said the only place he wants to be is Warwick, and to me it says the only place he wants to be is Monash, then something is wrong. Yeah? Stay healthy, super important. Get enough sleep, exercise, eat fruit, drink a lot of water, relax. And these are habits that can't just start at the meetings. Do it now. Make it a part of your life as a PhD student. Yeah, It has to be a habit. It has to be a part of your life to do exercise. Go running, go walking. How to make your interview stand out. Be engaged, be passionate. Again, people are looking for a colleague and not for someone who's so dull that you always hope that when you see them in lunch break, they don't ask you to go for lunch with you. Now you want to have someone around 
who you are excited to have as a colleague. So be engaging um, and, and happy to talk about your work. When people ask you a question in the interview, don't feel like, oh, someone wants to kill you, destroy your work. No, they, they are just curious. They want to learn. They want to understand. Um, if an interviewer asks a specific question, um, then try to really go for that and um, follow that lead and don't say, oh, l let me tell you again about my job market paper. But sometimes interviewers want to see exactly, can you think out of the box? Can you think beyond your specific topic? Um, then overall, the point is people want an excellent colleague to have around in the office. The fly out or now maybe zoom out again, celebrate every fly out is a victory. Yeah, um, and as soon as you have an offer, that's the floor you can't fall below. Yeah, so celebrate every step of the process. Campus visits can be super tiring. I don't know, before I went on the market, I never had this experience of having to be alert from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., meeting 20 different people, um, giving a job talk, going for dinner with people who are fresh because they took a nap, you didn't, and suddenly they want to talk with you about life and about, uh, even in one job interview, someone started talking about sex. You, you have to really expect everything. Yeah? Be prepared, be fresh. Um, study carefully people's CV. Look at photos, look at major papers. Be an engaging person to talk with. Um, importantly, the job market talk is a general interest talk. You may have given 50 different talks or five or 10 in your department, maybe in the development seminar, in the labor seminar and so on. Once you come to a job talk, you will have theorists in the room, macroeconomists, microeconomists, experimentalists, and they can ask whatever comes to their mind. Yeah? So don't expect the same set of questions you've heard 50 times. They could be completely different. So tailor your talk to this general audience and also in the preparation, try to find people doing mock talks with you who are from different subfields. Be professional, um, even if you think you can land a better job. I've seen candidates who weren't really behaving nicely when they came to say Warwick because they thought they can get to MIT, Harvard, Stanford. And in the end, those places didn't make them an offer and then suddenly they had to accept you know or start talking so be nice uh, and even if you don't land a certain job um, leave a good impression lots of candidates get flyouts at top departments who just had uh, want to hedge their bets um, but they don't make you an offer in the end but try to leave a good impression because you will see these people again as referees as editors and so on so how to make your fly out stand out. Um, importantly, in these um, visits on campus or on Zoom, same thing, you talk one-on-one -on -one with people and 50% of the time you will probably talk about research, about your work, maybe about their work. But there are also people who just want to talk about life and why you're interested in Warwick, in Monash, in Stanford, in whatever. And they just want to see whether you are a cool person to talk with, because maybe they are theorists, you are an empiricist, maybe you will never talk at the level of uh, work, but maybe you want to play football together, go for a beer together and so on. So give an outstanding general interest talk, that is how you can make your uh, visit stand out and generally try to come across as an excellent person to have around in a department. Now, the negotiations offers. Once you get an offer, amazing stuff. Celebrate, um, open a bottle of wine. Um, some departments make rolling offers and set rolling deadlines. So that process, there is nothing that is predictable. Some departments have certain rules. LSE usually looks at all candidates. Then they have a big meeting mid-February and then they make offers to two or three candidates and they don't care whether these candidates in between had exploding offers elsewhere. Other universities do rolling um, deadlines. Deadlines can be short or long, and some departments do that for strategic reasons. The Asian departments often do that. Chinese departments set crazy, super short deadlines. Um, and that can have these strategic reasons, but often there is simply the attempt to clear the pipeline. Also, a department that has three open positions wants to fill them. So if every candidate asks to have a deadline until 
end of April, and then in the end, everyone declines, the department stands there empty handed. So there is a reason why departments have deadlines, because they might still be willing to hire the second best candidate. And if they lose all of them, then they hire no one. Salaries. Often people go by here, say there is stuff on econ job rumors, lots of that is complete nonsense. I, when I negotiated, I had one person telling me, oh, you're only offering me this. I had heard you pay 20% more. And I said, where do you get, did you get that from? And then, well, hearsay. Yeah, it's often just wrong. Um, what's often forgotten when we talk about income is health insurance and pension stuff. People go by this headline number, this is what we offer you, that's our package. And what the package is, often is not 100% clear. Sometimes health insurance is included in the figure that's quoted. Pension contributions are included in the figure. Other departments forget about that, they take it for granted that, oh yeah, sure, we also pay 20% in your pension, but mm, that's real money. I mean, it's future income. Um, then other stuff you should also listen to is relocation allowances, housing allowances, are there caps? Because you can't move from the US to Europe by just 500 euros. Yeah? You need potentially more relocation allowance, stuff like that. Um, be honest, we talked about that issue before. At the latest, when it comes to an offer, you have to put all cards on the table. Yeah, so I've had cases where negotiating suddenly after five phone calls with the same candidate, they tell me, oh, by the way, I have a wife and three kids, or I have a husband and uh, two dogs. It, that's too late. Yeah? And be, uh, once you have the offer, put everything on the table. If that is a crucial thing, like I only come if you also give a job to my better half, <laughs> say it as early as you can. Yeah. Now, the whole spouse's partner issue is a tricky one. And if you are, say, have a partner in the same PhD program and you're both on the market, it's always a diplomatic issue. Should you reveal that in the application? Yes or no? I'm a big fan of full information also because often, at least in urban or metropolitan areas like Melbourne, uh, neighboring universities can help each other out. Like one person applies to Monash, the other applies to universities, can hire both, but maybe one hires this person, the other hires that person, but that coordination cannot happen. The AA has these signals, those often arrive too late. So if you have a signal, it doesn't hurt to also send it somehow directly to someone in a committee so that that information isn't lost. My last slide. Um, Many departments can't do too much about salaries. It's typically top-notch US uh, and European departments who can offer you 20% extra on a maybe starting salary, but many departments just can't. They are frozen in a salary structure set by the government. So don't expect wonders if there are no wonders to be had, but maybe there are other margins where they can help like research money, etc. Don't also forget, even if now you don't earn your salary you die for, dream of, um, you may later. What's most important, I think, early in the career, at least for me it was, is to be in a place where I was happy, where I had great colleagues, where I had good seminars, where I was able to travel, and where I could get my stuff published. And I was in places in my life that weren't top in the rankings, but at least I had time and I made use of that time. Um, and if you have an offer and once you've made up your mind, decline everything else as soon as possible. Yeah, because other people's career depends on you saying no. Yeah? Because uh, often it's a matter of just hours where maybe you overstretch the declining a second or third offer and that other person just loses out completely because uh, for them it's too late. Yeah, so be fair and help each other out. Let me stop here. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Sasha and Ludovica and Ouija for, for those, uh, for that sort of concentrated, uh, a lot of advice uh, in, in just uh, 40 or 50 minutes. So we do have some time for some, uh, a Q and A session. So, what we're going to do is, if you if you do have a question, please feel free to uh, sort of raise your hand in the Zoom, and I will try to get to you 
and uh, so you can ask your question. And when you when you do ask your question, could you please uh, say your name and your affiliation, just so we know uh, who's calling and um, who's asking and uh, where they're asking from. So I saw one raised hand from Sylvia. Hi, my name is Sylvia and I'm, I'm from the University of Melbourne. I have one question, uh, I think for Sasha. Um, so Ludovica said that to be to try to be honest and you said to try to be honest, but at which point should we give all information, for example, on how many interviews we have uh, to the hiring committee? So if in interview they ask how many interviews you have, should we declare it or we should so say only on the fly out? How does, how does it work? Um. I personally, I think I don't tend to ask that question, but um, I know that some people do. And why wouldn't you want to say it? Um, I think the fear people have is always that the other side, if you, if you give a big number, say you say 30, that then they say, ha, ah, she's never going to come. Yeah. Um, but if you say, um, I rather don't tell you, or you say five, um, what does it buy you, um, right? Then if you don't want to say it, it, it sounds as if you are hiding something. Um, if you say a low number, that's not true. And then they see you in the same hotel 20 times, always in the elevator. Um, you don't have a story, why, why, why do that, right? <laughs> because you have 30 interviews maybe. <laughs> so I think being honest doesn't harm. Again, let me remind you of the disclaimer. Ask that question to 10 other academics and then take an average, yeah? I don't see any other raised hands. Please feel, ah, I do see one. Uh, Sugat. Uh, hi, I'm Subhat Chaturvedi from Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi. And my question is basically, uh, how much does it matter if, uh, if let's say my job market paper is co-authored with junior faculty members, uh, conditional on the fact that I can demonstrate what my unique contribution to that is. And my second question is basically, uh, does it make sense to apply selectively in the first year to the job market and then maybe apply more in a more complete sense in, in the next year? Um, let me start with the second one. I'm not sure what selectively means, uh, like testing the waters, whether you uh, and informally, you, you, you send some emails to a few places saying, here is my work, I would like to give a seminar, or going on the market, but only sending out 10 applications. And if it doesn't work so well, then you wait a year and then you go back again and submit 500 applications. What do you have in mind? Right. The, 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 the second point. I think uh, um, mostly because I can. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, you were done. Okay. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not a big fan of this. Oh, I try and then I try again. Yeah. You should go when you're ready. Yeah. Um, I know there are circumstances where people is in here 23 of the PhD and at some point they have to go. Yeah? But uh, let's forget about that case. Um, ideally you should go when you're ready yeah? because it's not only you going on the market. Essentially, loads of other people go with you on the market. Your advisors have to write letters. People invest a lot of time. For me, writing I, this year, I wrote letters for six people. Yeah? It's crazy work. I mean, I, I haven't seen my family for a long time yeah, because I write letters, okay? Um, you don't want to do that just because you want to test the market. Yeah? That's not fair, okay? Um, 
your first question was co-authoring. Okay. So again, I may have a very idiosyncratic view on this. There are some people who say it's very important to have a single author job market paper. Um, but I think that is less and less true because the market more and more recognizes that economics is a very collaborative discipline. We no longer write these kind of John Nash style 10 page uh, theory papers, but uh, we write big papers that are 100 pages and where lots of different skills come together. And that is the norm once you have landed a job. And I personally find it ridiculous that just to signal how great we are alone in a job market paper, we should do a different game than what the profession generally looks like. This being said, again, there are people who still ideally want to see you have this single author masterpiece. Yeah. Now, my view on that second point is um, if you co-author with classmates, it is typically relatively clear that you are not just free writing. Yeah. Unless there is rumors about, oh, this guy never does anything. It's all the classmate. Yeah? When it comes to senior co-authors, um, some people say, well, look, um, he's written with Atsumoklu and he's written with this and that person. My thinking is, well, Atsumoklu can pick 50 different PhD students. Why does he write with that person? Yeah. So again, the signal to noise thing, that is what the interview is about and what at the latest the flyout is about. I've I have seen people with top five papers co-authored who in the interview just weren't able to say much, yeah? And then filtered out, yeah? Um, or in the job talk. So I think the market can somehow sort it out. You should do that also, what you are comfortable with. I'm, for instance, a person, I, I hate working by myself. I just don't like it. I, I strictly don't like it. I want to work with people. And still, I wrote a single author job market paper because 20 years ago, that's what I was told. Yeah? But today, I'm no longer sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, any other raised hands? Uh, I see one person physically raising their hand, Vani. Hi, I thank you all for your presentations. They're very informative. So my question is uh, kind of um, uh, leading on from Ludovica's presentation. So my priority is, of course, an academic career. So I'm very interested in applying, of course, going on the job market in the next year. But at the same time, I would not mind taking a job in an international organization. So I am uh, sorry, I am from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, and I'm actually based in Geneva. So when they ask you about what other places that you have um, applied to, does it sort of reduce your um, what they perceive as your level of motivation for an academic career if you say you have also applied to non-academic uh, organizations? Mm. Sure. So I think I, I think two things. Um, one is uh, I don't think that academic places um, will discount you because you applied also to international organization or private sector. I think we as economists understand the concept of hedging. Uh, if anything, I think there might be uh, what I've experienced. I didn't apply to international organizations. I applied to private sector um, somewhat more heavily this time around. Um, and they, everyone asked me, like, are you applying also for academics? They really sort of, you know, they don't want to spend the time to, to interview you and go through your process if you are going to take, uh, you know, um, a very low ranked school over them, right? Like they're trying to understand what's the probability. Um, again, I think that what's important there is honesty. Um, and I think that uh, what I said was, listen, I am applying broadly. Uh, you know, of course, if, if Harvard offers me a job, uh, you know, I think you can put it like put it in a joke, right? And go, if Harvard offers me a joke, I might cons uh, a job, I might consider it. But I'm also extremely interested in private sector. There are things about academia I love. There are things about academia I hate. And I think I could thrive uh, in this industry. And I think I could be extremely productive for your firm. Uh, and of course, it's a process and we'll see where it goes. Um, you know, there was somebody in the room, I got an early fly out in December and I was saying, you know, hey, if you decide, you know, I, I'll be out of the out of country 
next uh, week because I'll be at the European uh, Economic Association meetings. And they're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had already, if you had already accepted our job offer and you could go just go there on vacation. And I kind of like my face kind of broke uh, and that wasn't a good answer. So practice a good answer and, you know, and, and maybe put it in a joke and say, yeah, it would be nice. I would love to just visit Rotterdam for fun. And then, you know, if they make you an offer, and you, you then decide to refuse it because you want to, you know, try for the academic market. That's, I mean, that's absolutely fine. But yeah, transparency, but you, I think you can omit some details. You can sort of like finagle your answer, but never, you know, don't say you didn't apply to academic jobs if you did. I mean, that's not, that doesn't, doesn't pay off, I don't think. And what about from the other side? Um, if there's time, I would like to hear Sasha's answer as well. Like, do academic institutions discount your um, level of motivation if you if they know you also apply for non-academic jobs? No, I would fully agree with Ludovica that everyone understands hedging the bets. Um, but uh, similarly, as Ludovica said, private institutions may feel that they are. Um, the, your fallback or your last resort and that they waste energy on you. Yeah? Um, but again, there are ways to formulate everything in life diplomatically. Uh, you just have to think about it in advance and not stumble into an interview and then say, oh, I didn't expect that question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte, that's your raised hand. Yes, yeah, so that was a question just uh, for Sasha, but um, uh, following what uh, Ludovica just said in her presentations. So she said that she, from her experience, that um, be, uh, doing a postdoc doesn't um, get any discount on the market. Um, I want to hear Sasha's point of view from the other side of the market. Was that true from um, your experience? That's, uh, that's a tricky one. Um, I don't want to contradict Ludovica in any way, but I would say that people do also count the years that you've been out. So if say you've done a postdoc for three years and your CV is identical to three years ago, that doesn't help. Yeah, because there is a lot of memory in the market. Yeah, some people may have seen you three years ago and they may say, hmm, that's the same job market paper as three years ago. Well, uh, not much seems to have happened, right? And um, if a department can hire someone who has a great paper and is three years younger, so same CV, then the rookie may make the game. Yeah? So I would say that of postdocs, a little more is expected than of the PhD student was just finishing. Yeah, thank you. So we are over the hour, but if there are any raised hands, we, I think we can take a couple more questions. Uh, ah, Sylvia? You it's me again. If no one come, in, if no one has a question, I have a question for uh, uh, maybe Sasha, but all three of the panelists. Um, how do you think this market is going to be different with respect to the previous and the future? And which tips can you give us? Like, I think this is the most. Uh, like, I've been reading a lot of guides, and like, I have a lot of information on how the previous market have been, and I don't know anything how it's going to be this year. That's an even tougher one. I think no one can say. The thing I do observe is there seems to be already more action now than typically in December in other years. So for instance, two of the people I wrote letters for have a job already. Um, or signed last week because some departments try to use the current situation 
to skim people they would usually not have a chance to get. So they play with people's risk aversion. Yeah. Saying, okay, mate, here's an offer, but you decide by mid-December or you give the whole market a try, but you never know. Yeah. So that is what some departments exploit. At the same time, I must say, I am surprised just from whatever, looking at uh, Twitter job ads and stuff, that there is more openings than I would have expected six months ago. But still, I haven't done the math of uh, comparing the absolute numbers. But I think this market is hard to predict. But you know that. I'm not telling you anything new, I guess. What are your thoughts, Ludovica, Veja? I've been talking all the time. <laughs> Veja, you. Um, yeah, this is a fat, the, the realized uh, fat tail risk, right? So that's the case when no one can make any concrete prediction. Um, the one thing that uh, Again, this is with a Euro disclaimer that uh, this is the most difficult thing to see anything about. It looks like the market might be more uh, segmented than before because it's very difficult to travel. Like uh, uh, the Australian market, from the very limited information I heard, seem to be the supply side is mostly from Australian candidates because it's because we don't know whether um, international candidates will be able to 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 commence the job anytime soon. Is that an advantage or disadvantage? That's probably very heterogeneous uh, for different candidates. But that's a piece of information very limited piece of information, I think. I mean, one yeah. issue that comes up potentially and, uh, oh, sorry, Ulrika, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say something like, a, I mean, this, this is unprecedented, uh, right? But there have been, you know, over the years, um, I, I mean, you know, in 26, uh, you know, the, the year I was on the market, sort of that was the year before the elections in the US and then the year after, right? Like then there, there was a huge hiring freeze uh, when Trump uh, got into power. And that uh, meant that uh, a lot like, fly, you know, the Fed board canceled flyouts. Um, and, you know, the Fed system hires a ton of economists every year. So those are m smaller shocks, but I, I wanna say, you know, there, there have been some type of shocks, you know, that's kind of a bit of, there, there is volatility over the years uh, in terms of the supply side. Some of it is, is government induced, some of it, you know, it's a more private sector. Um, I do see a similar, like, I, I, it's true that like things are moving faster. So there is a, there is a bit more, um, there's a bit more, unraveling, if you wish, with some of these like early offers and, um, and whatnot. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, I think that there's also some, some people have postponed going on the market, folks who can uh, and who are funded, uh, which, which is a, you know, a potentially a decent remedy, though we don't know how next year is going to be either. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I had to say is just that, uh, you know, this is unprecedented. There have been years in which things have been slightly more, you know, the market has been tighter. Um, and um, I think ultimately everyone, you know, ultimately the market clears. Um, Sasha, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I just had one thought because uh, someone asked me that uh, a while ago. Um, do you think it's okay that I accept something now, but still continue searching? Mm, no, I don't think that's okay. Um, I strongly believe in a contract as a contract. If anything, you go on the market again next year, if you are unhappy 
with where you are. But accepting and then three months later saying, oh, I found something better, it's not good. Okay, so I think, I mean, we're 10 minutes past the hour. So I think we'll conclude there. So first of all, a huge thank you to all three speakers, to Ludovica, Ouija, and, uh, and Sasha for taking uh, the time to come and share your advice and your insights. I mean, I, I think we all learned uh, a lot today. And uh, I mean, I certainly did. And second, Thank you for all the participants who, who came in today. We had over 120 people uh, from joining from, I, I suppose, all over the world. So it's, a, it's an incredible turnout. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, soon at our regular uh, webinars, the first one of which is tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, Australian time. Is that right, Ashani? That's right. It's at 11 p.m. Yeah. Uh, Central and European time. And, right. And yeah, and so everybody have a, a stay safe and have a, a good holiday season as well. And good luck on the job market. All the Whereas, best. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Ludovica, Sasha, and Ivan. Um, Regia, yes. Thank you so much. I think uh, that was that was quite informative. Yeah. Thank you, Ashani. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Thank see you. you. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Ivan. So that was great. I thought. <laughs>